Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you very much for joining us this evening uh, for the panel discussion as part of Ben Grosser's exhibition, Software for Less. We have Ben Grosser here, Wendy Hugh Kyung Chan. Sorry, Wendy, yeah. you'll have to. Well, this is it. Uh, Matthew Fuller and Joanna Mo, and my name is Nimrod Vardy. I'm the founder and creative director of Arbyte. Um, a bit of housekeeping, we're just recording this uh, session, this meeting. Um, and if you have any questions, please do ask them in the chat and we'll respond to them at the end or during the conversations. We'll see how it goes. Um, again, thank you very much for joining us. Um, a bit about Arbyte, if you don't know Arbyte. Arbyte is a non-for-profit organization based in East London, founded in 2013, commissioning artists working in the intersection of digital practices, new technologies, and critical thinking. This event aims to discuss software as culture, the politics of interface, and the power imbalance or balance between user and cooperation within today's digital technologies and social media platforms. Um, the panel discussion is part of Software for Less, an exhibition examin examining the cultural, social, and political effects of software and contemporary society by US artist Ben Grosser. Um, a bit about the exhibition, um, Software for Less will take, takes the visitors on a journey through a pseudo science, a pseudo tech exposition. Each work in the exhibition is present, presented as a product that could have come out of alternative Silicon Valley interrogating the, and reimagining how software is created, operated, and sold. The exhibition provokes the viewer to consider the influence of software has on us foregrounding social media platform as the main impetus. How is an interface that foregrounds of friend count changing our conception of friendship? Who benefits when software system can intuit how we feel and ultimately questioning how software molds who we are? As I said, we have um, some very, very interesting panel joining us today. Um, Matthew Fuller is a professor of cultural studies at Goldsmith University of London. Recent book, Investigate, Investigative Aesthetics, Bleak Joys, and Software Studies, a Lexicon. He is the co-editor of the journal Computational Culture. Hello, Matthew. We have Joanna Mo. Uh, she is a ba Barcelona Berlin-based artist, researcher whose work critically explores the way techno-capitalist narratives affect the alphabetization of machines, humans, and ecosystems. Recent exhibition venues include Venice Biennale, ZKM, Ars Electronica, and Transmediale. Her projects have been featured in the New York Times, The Spiegel, Wild, Fest Company, and many others. And Wendy Hugh Kion Chan is a Canada 150 researcher uh, in the new media at Simon Fraser University, where she leads on Digital Democracy Institute. Recent book include programmed visions and updating to remain the same. Her book, Discriminating Data, is due to out in November. She is previously the chair of Modern Culture and Media at Brown University. Thank you for joining us. And of course, Ben Grosser, focuses, an artist focuses on the culture effects of software. Recent exhibition venues include the Barbican Center in London, Museum Queen's Castle House in Berlin, sorry, Museum de Kuminigas in Lisbon, and Gallery Chalot in Berlin. His work has been featured in the New Yorker, the Atlantic, the Guardian, and many others. And of course, he got a show with us now at the gallery. Um, Saturday is the last day, and we have an artist talk and a tour you're all very, very welcome. So thank you all for joining us today, uh, this evening. And Ben, do you want to take it from here? Yeah, thanks, Nimrod. I'm happy to be here. And thank you to everyone for uh, coming together around this. I really appreciate it and appreciate your time. Um, this is essentially my dream panel. So it's not often you get your dream panel. Uh, so, um, so what I've, yeah, I mean, what I've done for us today is I really just prepared some questions uh, around kind of some of the themes of the show, but also thinking about themes within the work that you all do in your various uh, outputs, and um, I, I really just mean them as a way to kind of generate conversation around the idea of software as culture, and um, we can veer in whatever way is possible. So. I'll start off with question one and, and we'll see how it goes. Um, 
Within the landscape of opaque feed algorithms, unpredictable recommendation systems, and other black box decision systems used by today's big tech platforms, users have been conditioned to make themselves as legible as possible. Thus, likes and follows and content views and other signals are not only enacted by users to record presence and or consume media, but are also central actions users employ with hopes of gaining visibility and influencing that landscape. And so that's kind of the intro to the question, which is, you know, what are the effects of this conditioned need to show ourselves to algorithms? And how does it circumscribe our ability to imagine agency within computational spaces? And I'll, I'll let anyone kind of uh, choose to start there. Well, I mean, I, 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 one thing that would be to take a, a link from some of the work in the show. And I think one of the things that um, the show is extremely good at is, is showing the, the way in which uh, universals or you know, proposed universals are produced at a very thin set of grammar of, of activities. So, you know, the, 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 the way in which uh, the different works show that the language of interface uh, that's, that's available through, some, through something like Facebook, of, of liking, of sharing, of, you know, carrying out a very small set of actions, then gets turned into a kind of linguistic um, procedure, which can then get replicated. And this produces a kind of unending sentence of actions which are, pro which are programmatic actions at one level, but they're also linguistic actions that look like social effects and they have social effects. Uh, so what, what's interesting, I think there is what you show, you show the absurdity of this, uh, of these kind of structures by taking them at face value. And, you know, there's very much this uh, reading the interface for its own, for the own, the statement it makes. So it's almost as if you were putting Facebook down on the couch and listening to it. What is it, you know, what is it, what is it, what are you saying about your mother, Facebook? Oh, I like my mother and so on. And this is what it can say. And this is its unconscious and its unconscious is really thin, really brittle and it's fraying at the edges. It can't contain all the humanity is surging into it. And this is where the problems start. So I'd say one, one way is, is language. Yeah, I certainly, I mean, thank you for that, Matthew. Um, I certainly, I mean, obviously I, I couldn't disagree. Um, and I, more than that, I fully agree. I think, you know, the, the, the project that I have in there now and the new ones for this show, Platform Sweet Talk, um, you know, that just really grows out of literally reading and trying to capture all of the notification sentences, the, the, the grammar of notifications that, mm. that Facebook is, producing for the user and um, coming to a realization over a, 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 a amount of time that I honestly I underestimated how vast that grammar was. Um, just how much, how many different variations, they're, they're, it almost feels infinite sometimes. It's not infinite, but it's hundreds and hundreds of different sentences and different structures that are really just uh, meant to drop in you know, that are designed to drop in your information. And once you take your, you know, your, your slot in the database um, out of those sentences, um, you realize just how, how little, how there's nothing there. <laughs> the only, they, they just rely on the, your name and the names of your friends and things like that to try to key you in. Um, anyway, you know, for me, one of the things, maybe this is a little bit, I mean, it, it's related to the topic, but for me, one of the things that I like the most of, uh, of your work, and I've had fun for years, um, it's when you make all these interfaces naked, like when you question them by especially taking things out, especially in the, in the case of the metricator and others, is that you unveil much more. It's not that you take out and, and, and something become less all of a sudden, no? Um, you just reveal, especially like the business model, 
and all these apparatus uh, that forces all these users to keep on producing data because this is what these companies actually need because they feed on raw data. Yeah, now let's not forget that Facebook uh, primary business model is um, is ad tech. Yeah, so they really need massive amounts of data to keep nurturing uh, their uh, money making machine. And I think that you do it in a very subtle, not violent way, which I think it's so obvious and it smash you in the face almost. No, like that's what it is, right? Take the numbers. There is no business model. There is no company, and it's such a small, tiny turn yeah and yet it's so powerful and i really love this about i think it's something that's very present in all of your works and i think that's super really powerful and for me it's been a a great inspiration for do a lot of the workshops i do i mean related with interface and energy you know but following this idea of just modifying a tiny bit just to reveal like a whole world and a whole huge machinery that is super obfuscated behind the, the interface um so I think I'm not sure if this answers your question, just was keeping the conversation. I think it was worth mentioning this. Oh, no, I, I appreciate it. Like I said, it doesn't need to go in, in any particular directions, but you know, it was really part of what I was thinking about is, is this kind of the way in which the designs of these systems uh, encourage us to make ourselves legible. They, they kind of put this burden on the user of like you just need to tell me more about yourself like if you're not getting what you want from the system then that's not something we've done poorly it's that you haven't given us enough um so that's that was part of what i was thinking about with that question yeah and i think that's really key because one thing that these systems demand and not just these systems but one can think through the political structure right now is um the demand to be authentic um, and the idea that one is authentic when one reveals an open secret about oneself, um, when one's inside and outside correspond. Um, and I think that the playing with the internal and the external, or the idea that these two should be conflated, um, is actually really powerful in terms of thinking um, of the ways in which your projects disrupt habit. Um, because what habit does, of course, is take something external, like a, a notification. This is you start gaining a habit when you have this external notification, but then it becomes internal. Um, so you actually don't need the notification anymore because you've internalized um, the act of liking, looking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and I think that one thing that your work does is to actually keep accentuating the external. Um, and the, the role the external plays in order to, to move us away from simply internalizing it or to be aware of the ways in which we've internalized it. And I think this larger question of external, internal, um, this drive to be quote unquote authentic um, um, is also something that we can trouble in terms of agency um, when we think of habit seriously as second nature. What, what habit implies and brings out is that humans are fundamentally creative that we create another form of nature, that um, we're characters, not marionettes. Um, and I think that thinking through that um, is, is one way to get at a, a fundamental opacity um, that exists even when we're called on to be legible and transparent. Um, <clears throat> I think there's maybe two works in the show, Ben, that does respond. Maybe there's a lot, not, maybe there's a lot more works in the show that respond to that, but the two that comes to mind is not for you. Um, with, with the way that it obfuscates the, the user and changes the entire TikTok, that is um, the, the, the method of TikTok and creating something that is not authentic anymore, that it's not yourself, that it's someone that is not you. It's maybe almost the complete opposite. And then another, another work is Platform Sweet Talk. Um, with the notification that it brings and the way they lose the, the user to continue absorb uh, and engage with the platform. It's, it's, a, it's an ongoing relationship that just needs to be, well, I guess, similar to order of magnitude in, to an extent, just more and more and just keeps bringing you into the same um, chamber that you're always stuck within. Um, and of course, there's so many other works in the show and general works of yours that do kind of emphasize on this need of the user and platform relationship and it's never ending type of relationship. I think one, one of the things that maybe is, 
it's something prompted by um, what Wendy said around um, the inside and the outside should correspond within uh, within these systems, and that one should answer to one's true name. You should be registered uh, within your true identity and reveal yourself. You know, the, to confess to the the social media machine. But it's, it's also interesting that the inside and the outside are also, um, and the comparison between them are also one of the tools, the kind of one of the central tools of critique, you know, that we, we look under the bonnet of, in order to see the machine, you know, so that the, the, critical, um, uh, the critical mode is often about seeing what's inside and say, okay, they're, they're, this on the, they're doing this on the surface, but actually underneath, there's all these other processes going. And in a way, uh, the critical mode asks the same of Facebook um, as, as that, you know, Facebook asks of us is, you know, if to ask for a reciprocal relationship. I wonder on the one hand, whether there's, there's a polit potential politics there of uh, reciprocal exchange of information or whether something that Wendy also said was, you know, there's an opacity, a necessary opacity, which is, you know, been an absolute part of, you know, 20th century aesthetics uh, to think of impossibilities of representation. And maybe there's a tension there in, your, in, in the work and in the, the issues we're talking about that is maybe the tools of critique aren't quite right anymore in, in a sense. You know, maybe the, the tools that are, you're, you're offering uh, or the, the, the way of thinking about these things is to, to act uh, and create different centers of power, different kinds of momentum, different kinds of force that change, uh, change relations of power. And that, you know, the, the critique and confession as the kind of two modes of balancing the inside and outside, maybe, you know, we're at a, a turning point um, where something else is happening. Yeah, that's a all, both all of that really gets I get gets me thinking about you know there's a one of the things I end up thinking about is is the is the position from which one critiques the system and the the complications that arise I, I, I suspect Joanna I mean I know thinking about Joanna's work I can only imagine this has happened for her too but it's you know how much you can or how much you're able to critique a system from within that system? Or how much do you have to step outside the system and look at it in order to see it? It's like, where do you see it? And I think part of the, from, from my perspective, part of the complication of uh, being critical of a Facebook, being critical of TikTok is that to understand TikTok is to be lost in TikTok. It's like, it's, you know, it's not that you can't be critical and can't have a strong critical vantage point from outside the system. But there's also something about the affective experience of feeling the, the need to flip to the next video, of um, feeling that moment when you, in my opinion, buy into the mythology of, of, of its famed uh, AI feed algorithm that it really gets you. And, and being able to, to then find a, a vantage point. And, and from my perspective, I, you know, I find it both valuable to get lost and, and, and really feel the push and pull, the affective push and pull that the systems produce in me through its interface. But um, at the same time, it means I really do get lost in it. And, I, <laughs> and that sometimes means I can't see. Um, it, it's difficult to, to know what I'm looking at. And I just really have to muddle my way through it. I don't know if Joanna, if that has any. Absolutely. I was thinking like how obsessively, you know, I'm checking my Twitter feed a lot of times and uh, it just like, yeah, it's a bit uh, schizophrenic a lot of times because indeed I do believe that you have to go really deep into the systems and, and be like a user that's been you know, like, as you said, like really immersed in, into all these platforms in order to be able to criticize them. But at the same time, I think you also miss a lot of points and you miss, you miss perspective in, in many ways. Um, so this process of detaching, 
I think we just detach a little bit because I think that there is a lot that we are unable to see. Like a lot of times I thought that I've never been in Silicon Valley, for example. I've never been sitting in, in an office of somebody working at Google or, or having a coffee with an engineer. That And I think that's something that is also really needed to understand all the culture that is being then uh, sort of put into all the design of, of these platforms. Um, so I think that we can do, I think what, then you and I, I think we share, we just detach like we are, like we detach a part and we criticize a part of the user, which I think is what we can, we can bridge. But indeed, it's, it's really, really, really hard. Um, and a lot of times, I'm not sure how effective it is. Um, yeah, but it's, it's, it's hard. It's because also you question your own means of critic, uh, critique, right? Uh, it's exactly what Matthew said. Is it valid this anymore? Is it not valid? I, I'm, I have no idea. And sometimes I, I also doubt it. It's, uh, it's really a process. Yeah, I wish I would have an answer for that. But yeah, it, it's schizophrenic. <laughs> and it, it don't really, yeah. A lot of times I feel we do a lot of instinctive work as well. Although I think what's arguably compelling about a lot of your work, Ben, is that you don't go into it. Like if you think through um, uh, the the more or less, right? It's it, the the answer is there. It's 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 in your face. You don't you don't need to go into it. What you show is that that is there present. Um, and I th and I wonder at all too because. Um, for not for you, um, you say that you, you you mix things up, not for you to make TikTok less addictive. But I wonder if it really does do that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you mean if, if it really makes TikTok less addictive for the user? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't think so. I mean... It's pretty difficult. Part of, one of the things I found in, in making it and running it and trying it is that it's it, tremendously difficult to push that algorithm in any way. It it seems, I mean, you know, I would go through all these different test accounts and and trying to you know, experiment with like, well, what if I give it this kind of a signal? What if I push it in this direction? What if I let it wander over here? And what I would see over and over again is it just kept feeding me the same kind of thing. It, you know, it, no matter how much I told it, I don't want this and I don't want that. It would say, well, how about more of this? How about more of that? I mean, it just, it, this is where I, I honestly think that they have, ByteDance, TikTok has benefited from a mythology, like they've allowed, they've generated and allowed a mythology to kind of proliferate through the, through the journalistic discussion of, of their company that, and, and the user's um, understanding of it, that they really, they, they have the best AI ever that really gets you. And I think really what, what's missing in that critique and where Not For You doesn't really address this at all in, in, what it, in its intervention, which is that it's not that the, the algorithm understands people, it's that the design of the interface and the type of the structure of the content is, makes people forget about the things they're not interested in and remember the things they do find interesting. It makes it so easy to flip past. And it also makes it so that the user feels like there's such low cost to trying another video because it's maybe only 15 seconds at most. And even so I can flip past it if I don't like it. That just makes me keep going, flip, 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 flip. Oh, it gets me here. This one is good. Flip, 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 flip. You know, like again. So I, I, I don't know. I don't think it does, Wendy, but I also, I'm not even sure it's doing the right thing. It's just, it's an experiment. Yeah, no, I know Matthew wants to get in, but I just want to say one thing really quickly along that line. Uh, I think that one uh, definition of ideology that I find completely compelling is Richard Dean's notion, which is that ideology always misses. It's broadcast, it's just sent out there. And it's actually the subject that closes the, the loop by overhearing or eavesdropping. Um, something that's not meant for it, but it closes and short circuits it so the, the message hits. Um, and I think that that might be one way of thinking through um, what's happening and the idea that, you know, this could be total BS. TikTok could be, what you could have shown is TikTok shows everybody the same thing, right? And everybody nonetheless somehow feels that this is personalized to them. 
um, because of precisely those those issues of structure that you bring up. And so the, the depth or, or what Matthew was talking about in terms of the desire for cultural critique or to, to pick up the underside is what drives this belief in this profoundly personalized system um, rather than, than the other way around. Uh, you're on mute, Matthew. The, sy the systems are also designed to kind of hijack and reroute human capacity for empathy, projection, transference, uh, to, to read emotion and intent into the behavior of simple, simple procedures, simple uh, interface elements, and so on. And that's that's a really uh, that's a really potent thing. So that, and you know, many many systems historically have done this. You know, his, religions tarot cards, uh, any kind of oracle system, we, we believe it's going to tell us something. And because we, we transfer that belief, it is able to tell us something. And so we get something out of the transaction. But what it, what it is, is, um, you know, is, is debatable in, in some way. And we need to learn the skills to read it in a proper, in a proper manner. But I, th I think one of the things that um, both you and Joanna do is is really this adding additional machines to these machines. You know, so you're not simply watching and getting befuddled. You know, you're you're kind of rerouting them and making making other compositions out of them. So adding adding assemblages to assemblages, and that's I, I think that's a really interesting um, way of working for the but that both of you have. Yeah, I appreciate that. It's um, it, you know, just I guess one reaction I still have to that too is is the way in which there's I'm still puzzling with this a little bit in in my head as I think about TikTok and its and its role and kind of its place, but the way in which it sets up a system by which the the best way to express creativity within its platform is 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 a form of mimicry i mean that's kind of what it the that's part of what it sets up is that if you can if you want to be part of this culture then the way to be be part of this culture is to show that you get it by doing the same thing that everyone else is doing and thinking Wendy, about your suggestion that maybe there's not even, maybe everybody's just seeing the same thing, right? Like that, that would be an effective way of, of, of kind of reinforcing that idea that we're just supposed to do what everybody else is doing. Um, I think it's maybe a little bit more sophisticated than that and that it, it feels mostly just like the YouTube algorithm to me, where it's kind of like you watch one cat video, now you get 100,000 cat videos suggested to you. Um, or really, maybe you watch one cat video, you get 10, you watch two cat videos, you get 100, you watch three cat videos, you get 1,000, whatever it is. It's not, you know, it's just it figures out. It's kind of um, uh, characterizes you based on all of the data it's got about everybody else and, and what they've watched previously. Um, maybe it would make sense for me to move to an, another question, unless anybody had a, another thought along those lines. Um, so here's question two. Big tech has normalized the idea that endless growth is unavoidable, speed is desirable, and scale is a requirement for platform success. Yet every platform that conforms to these norms always ends up with a host of problems from the viral spread of mis or disinformation to the amplification of racism to the erosion of democracy. To what extent do you see today's platform problems as rooted in Silicon Valley's focus on scale and growth and speed? And what, if any, future opportunities do you see in a return to smaller scale online communities? I mean, I think one, one, one response would be to say it's, it's not just Silicon Valley, it's, it's capitalism. Which is, you know, is, is reaching is reaching its its limits in terms of what it can do to the the planet, in terms of extraction and despoilation. Um, globalization over the past few decades has, you know, created a, a, a you know a single platform planet to some extent, which is which is which is one based on, around the ideas of certain kinds of market being the primary uh, primary form of human interaction. And 
Silicon Valley's, you know, zero, uh, zero to one strategy uh, is, is, you know, essentially to establish global monopolies within that space. And in a sense, one could say, okay, that all they're doing is corresponding to, uh, to the globalization of, of capitalism. And in order to survive uh, in, in that space, which, you know, has been developed for hundreds of years, this is this is the point they're at at the moment and you know one can say okay they're they're cynical they're ruthless uh but but there's something more fundamental that we have to work out and to go beyond which is you know we have to we have to get rid of capitalism ultimately as a as a, as a system because it, it is just trashing the planet and is it's unsustainable and silicon valley is a victim of that you know we have to weep for these people I think I, I also did totally. <laughs> That's a nice point. <laughs> also, I think that uh, in terms of what we could do on, on looking at the weak points, I think that those infrastructures, even if they are super national and they seem they are super powerful and super resilient, I think we need to, to uh, remember that they are really, really fragile in the sense that they're so hierarchized um, and like the central. Uh, powers are very well placed in a way that if something fails, and we saw it what happened with the Facebook a few weeks ago, right? Like the whole platform failed. And I think this can act, um, or it's the same case with most of the super infrastructures that uh, run uh, ultra capitalism at large. And I think there is a lot of um, things to explore there in this fragility that we don't tend to see. But it's there. Something fails. It's the same with the internet, you know, like if Ashbourne goes the internet mostly goes if amazon goes which every three hops you have like a, a amazon server the internet goes and when this goes and when this collapse there is like a lot of space for the thing to flourish because probably if when these things happen people can organize much more in a local space it's like okay internet is not reliable those things are failing and then obviously we have i mean we still need to communicate and then we just do more contextualized structures right and, and I think that's like uh, something that's very, very worth exploring um, because, as I said, I don't think we tend to see these infrastructures as fragile. Uh, just to add to what's been said, I would also push back a little bit on the idea that smaller communities are somehow better because mm -hmm. um, surveillance in small communities is really good. And they, your neighbor knows what you're doing. Um, there's a way in which smaller isn't necessarily better. Um, and I think maybe the way that um, Matthew's framed it in terms of, of capitalism um, is, is one way to, to think through this. Because I know that, that you've, been, you've been doing like really great work trying to think through minusing and, 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 and degrowing and what would that look like. And, and degrowing is different than making smaller. Because in a capitalist system, you could be degrowing just to maintain the same, right? Um, and so perhaps one thing is, is thinking through that relationship. Um, and also what I find so profoundly um, disturbing about the way Silicon Valley is, operates is its mode of organization. Right. So it's based on, so a lot of the recommender systems, of course, are, are based on homophily, the notion that similarity breeds connection, right, which has profound ties in U.S. residential segregation. Um, but so it, what it does is it creates agitated clusters of comforting rage, right, because there, this homophily is allegedly put in, in um, place because it's believed that somehow if you're around people who are like you, you're more comfortable. And what the Facebook leak showed is like when they did that, put you with people like you, friends and families, it got angrier. Like, like these people had never spent time in a family vacation or something, like just completely ignored personal experience. Um, so I think this, this mode of organization to create these, this anger, which actually makes us more predictable in the sense that when, when you're angry or agitated, you're far more likely to be triggered um, and therefore, to also take um, these tarot cards, as, as Matthew put it, and understand it as you, right, um, is, is really disturbing. And I think it gets to what Joanne has been saying about how fragile they are, too. Because if it's based on constant agitation and circulation and intensity, 
um, there's a way in which that can never always work, or that it creates its own um, modes of uh, failure um, that are really important to think through. And I think those modes of failure aren't simply making things smaller, um, but doing something else. Yeah, I certainly appreciate that. I'm, I think I've been the, maybe the reason I'm thinking and, and put, you know, could smaller provide some benefit um, is partially based in the, in the, the monopoly tactics of, of Peter Thiel and, and, and the rest to absorb everything into one system. And of course, as Matthew Apley points out that's they're they're just doing what the system already set up for them but there's i often think about there's a way in in which the the mode of practice in silicon valley maybe it's maybe it's just kind of the perfect storm of of the technology enables the co-option of individuals into a, a global whole um you know one of the things i learned from doing the the the, Zucker, the zuckerberg supercut was you know, there, there are these certain numbers that keep going up throughout his history, you know, first 15 years of Facebook. And one of those numbers is the user number. And he keeps citing how many users he has. And it's just going up and up and up until he gets to about 2 billion, at which points, while he still says what number he's at, he starts talking about a different number, which is how many he has left to get. And, and you know, he really, he, you know, he switches into that mode of like, how can he capture the last remaining six billion or whatever, you know, whatever it is. And it's often, I, I end up thinking about how the Silicon Valley is always, as, as one example of, of, of this, this kind of a problem, they, they generate their platforms with a, an all-encompassing focus on scale and growth getting as big as possible, getting everybody on the platform. And then they start introducing, then that introduces a whole host of problems, which, you know, in the case of what Wendy's talking about, right, it's one of those is that anytime they try to correct and, and go for a local focus as opposed to a global focus, it creates all these micro communities of, of rage and allows white supremacy to, to emerge in ways that hadn't done in, 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 in however long. And yet at the same time, um, they then introduce, I mean, they, they, they keep introducing things they think are fixing the problems. That's where algorithmic feeds come from. It's like once you get to so many people on a platform, then you've got to, like, you've got too much information for people to focus on and they get frustrated. They can't find what matters to them. And so then they say, well, we'll fix it. We'll pick an algorithmic feed. Um, and of course, the algorithmic feed then ends up encoding the way they think about what's important versus what anybody else might think is important and, and reinforces a certain way of thinking on to everyone on the platform. Um, I think that's part of what made me think about smaller and maybe by smaller, I'm simply meaning not everyone all in one place, <laughs> which is kind of the, hell of the way they think about it. Um, but, but, I, but I appreciate the points um, and it's, uh, the, this this complication between everyone connected and everyone all in one conversation, um, I think it's part of what I was what I've been thinking about. Yeah, I, th I think it's interesting. There's this there's a kind of utopic dimension to to Facebook, which is which is really naive and really brutal. But it, there is a kind of utopic dimension that is, uh, you know, you, you, there, there's something interesting about it, uh, but about its clumsiness. But it's something that's spreading across the world at the same time as the world is coming to the end of certain kinds of, you know, global, certain kinds of global systems are collapsing at the same time as Facebook is growing and collapsing in on itself. So we're seeing multiple, multiple dynamics playing out through Facebook you know, that we're coming to the end of of a certain kind of economic model's ability to, to run off the off, off the ecological basis of the planet. We're coming to the end of a certain, or at least the possible end of certain kinds of societal privilege, uh, or at least strong contestation of them. And all of these things which are, you know, uh, 
happening partly through platforms like Facebook and others are also wrecking its ability to provide a universal because it's universal is based around very simplistic, uh, very kind of minimal and, you know, um, proprietary models of what of what human communication can be or what universals might be or an imagined universal or imagined utopia might be. And it's, it's a very interesting collision of multiple kinds of collapse. I mean, you can see, you know, if, if you know, our bite is situated in the UK, you can see Brexit, for instance, as one of these, these moments of rejection of a certain form of globalization, but that comes in a reactionary mode because that's what's made available to people. And, you know, this, this we can see is, is also something that occurs through, uh, through the mechanisms of Facebook and, and, and others, the Cambridge Analytica scandal being one of the many kind of iterations of this. And so if we see, if we see Facebook not simply as, as one entity, but as, as a ground where multiple systems that are emerging, collapsing, grinding against each other are, are articulated and, and bear certain kinds of traces at certain moments in certain ways, even at the level of millions of data points or at the level of minute data points, we're, we're able to see a more, a more complex system um, in which Facebook is, is fragile and, is, as Joanna says, is, 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 is potentially able to fall apart very fast. Um, you know, remember Geospace or Geocities or MySpace uh, and so on. Um, you know, maybe, maybe in five years' time, we'll be thinking of, of, of another system. But it's this, this interesting moment of a universal utopia, which is being sold back as a service. Uh, what we need to do is rather than sell it as a service, actually, you know, start instantiating uh, some kind of system that would have more of a utopian dimension. I see the police in the background. In your, <laughs> in your... <laughs> just one note in this idea of collapse, I just like a very small anecdote that I shared with you uh, when uh, we changed some emails. I'm reading this super interesting book about scaling. Um, and the author, which I can't remember the name, um, says that uh, it's sort of a standard. It's sort of like a law that it, they don't know how it can be proven or how this happens yet, but it happens, it tends to happen, which companies tend to collapse when they reach half million net worth. I have trillion net worth. Um, I'm not sure how far Facebook and all these uh, giant ITs are from that, but um, I, think, I think it's gonna be interesting because I don't think they are so far and I think it's gonna be interesting how they're gonna fall. And I think they're gonna just be spread in small entities. Uh, I don't know what's gonna happen, but uh, yeah, I think we should uh, be aware of that. Be very interesting. So you think the best thing to do would be to increase their share price? Absolutely. Let's just feed them as much as we can. Let's just give them all the data, everything, like all our finger movements, anything we can. And then we'll see what happens. I mean, I think it could be like a reverse, you know, move because we tend that the protection is to give them less and to subtract our attention and to uh, just go out and again do like something in smaller communities. No, we just need to you know, accelerate their own decay. <laughs> but we might end up like Nick Land then. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, the, the one data point I could add here is that Facebook was the fastest company to achieve a $1 trillion valuation in the history of capitalism, um, 17 years. Um, so they've passed the we should, we, we should look and see when the half trillion mark happened and maybe that's 2016 or 2015 or so um, in Facebook's history. Um, maybe I'll move on to the next one here. Uh, so- but Just a question, was like oh, yeah. the valuation in the market? Or it was like the, um, the value of all their assets? It's, it's the capitalization in the market. Okay, because yeah. I think like what it counts, it's the assets actually. Oh, so yeah. yeah, I think that's yeah. what this, uh, this guy said in this book. Um, all right, so big tech's focus on growth and scale that we've been talking about, uh, very much from my perspective, is in service of the thing they most seek, which is more. Uh, it seems to fit the trillion dollar 
valuation we've been talking about. So this want is fundamental, driving how their software works, what it does, and what it makes possible or impossible. It's what leads them to engineer features such as visible like counts or algorithmic feeds or endless notifications because those interface elements all help them gain more users, more data, and thus more profit. One of my ideas behind this exhibition has been to invert their fundamental focus on more by imagining what I call software for less. In other words, software that by design wants less users, less data, or less profit. I wonder whether you think such a proposition has potential beyond the boundaries of anti-capitalist, artistic, or academic projects. Um, and further, are there other areas of society beyond social media, for example, where a focus on software for less might gain allies? Well, an easy one is global climate change, right? Um, I think that um, the ways in which that demand is, is for less literally, like in terms of electricity, feed, etc. I mean, by quote unquote saving things, we're just destroying the planet um, by putting them on the cloud. But I think there's a different way in which, just from what you said earlier, we can think through a relationship that's productive between global climate change and um, social media. Um, because as you pointed out, um, social media has been always trying to fix its problems, right? The idea is, okay, we've caused this, caused this, so let's try to fix it doing X, Y, and Z. And that's the logic of geoengineering. Right? So geoengineering is like, okay, well, this is happening, but in order to, we're going to keep the growth going, but we're going to do these things that will have the same kind of impacts that the, the feed changes will have. In other words, it'll make things profoundly worse. Um, and so if there's a way in which we can map out the way the interventions within social media to engineer a solution leading to things that are far worse, um, and link that to, to the promises of geoengineering and the fundamental premise of global climate change acti activists, which is we just need less. Um, and that's a very profound and, and difficult yet simple message. Sorry, Matthew, I thought I saw your... No, I was just trying to speak less, actually. But um, <laughs> <laughs> Well done. We're done. That's great. <laughs> no, I, I, I entirely agree with Wendy. I think that's, that's a very important point. Um, and a lot of this can be done th through engineering approaches as well. I mean, I think it's, um, it's important not to demonize solutions, but to, to recognize the certain kind of uh, an ideology of solutions. Um, and think about, you know, okay, I, I, you know, the, the recent uh, controversy uh, at Google around transformer algorithms, for instance, and large language models uh, led by Margaret Mitchell and Tim Gebru, I thought was a very, very good point that, you know, if, if, you, if you use more lean, more elegant uh, algorithms, you know, that, that require perhaps more, more sophisticated coding, um, maybe you'll, you'll get uh, some things that don't cause so much climate damage. And this, you know, this is an, in, in an era of kind of uh, resource intensity of, of the cloud, but also of large language models of, of machine learning and so on. Um, you know, perhaps uh, a return to the values of terseness and precision in coding and algorithm design uh, that you know was found in the sixties with people like like Dijkstra and in 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 coding with people like Donald Knuth, uh, maybe this could also be uh, a mode of a mode of less that's based around uh, a certain certain appreciation of elegance. Yeah, in terms of. I mean, I, I think I think it's a, a really a really good point. But in terms of applying these methods, um, and I think it happens. It's a bit the same fallacy of um, to produce green technology. Um, we need to use a lot of not green technology, right? And what happens with a, a lot of platforms, especially with Google, there's something um, called uh, legacy code or code legacy in English. I'm not really sure, which is like uh, a lot of um, 
the new platforms are based in very old code that cannot be touched, just like an archaeological you know, layers of code. So to build very simple code, you have also to rely in all this legacy code that's probably it's much more energy intensive what it's built on top, right? And, and a lot of times I wonder if it's actually possible to undo a, all this code and start from zero without all these platforms crashing which I think would be a great experiment, then maybe that's also a way that capitalism, uh, capitalism would crash, right? By attaching these layers of code. Um, but I'm just wondering like how feasible this is actually is to build like really low energy code that's actually as low energy as they say it is, right? I'm, I'm just wondering, eh? it's not. Yeah, I mean, I, I uh, just to be frank, I mean, Joanna, I think of, of some of your projects that try to make visible for, for anyone, everyday users, you know, just to give them even any idea of what's literally happening when you type one word into this single box on a clean white web page and and hey and say tell me the answer and and how that activates an infrastructure. Uh, I mean even how a, a, an entire infrastructure was activated in the hopes that you might type that word someday in the future uh, so that it could be ready with an answer. Um, and, and every time I show that, you know, show um, you know, your, your projects to students or, or colleagues, you know, it, it's, it's such a, a quick way of getting across the vastness that's hidden by the facade of, of the interface. And I think that's part of what I think about with, with the potential for kind of animating people into ideas about less. And I agree with, with, with Wendy and, and Matthew here on the kind of like the environmental movement the, and, and climate change as the climate crisis as the kind of a central uh, focus of, of, of a collection of individuals that are are going to maybe be motivated by the idea of less in the first place and trying to draw parallels to the ways in which the designs of software and in particular the aims of interface end up uh, trying to hide as much as possible of what's behind the scene. Um, I mean, certainly all the legacy code that you're talking about, I mean, that, that leads me to think about the fragility aspects we were talking about earlier, that there's, it's so much work to even undo. And if you, let's, let's say the aspiration was to be elegant, was to, to rethink. I mean, there's whole books on, you know, what happens when, when software developers and software development companies refactor with the name to like fix all of the old problems that they've inherited. And of course they just end up rebuilding many of them because it turns out there's a lot of time and effort into debugging that's, that's built into that legacy code. Um, that is maybe no longer visible um, because the people who did that work uh, are moved on other things or they've forgotten what they did in the first place. Um, so I do, you know, personally, I think anywhere in, in, the, in the various systems we contend with, you know, whether it's a computational system and platforms, whether it's uh, climate systems and, and how our actions are, are influencing them, uh, bringing to the foreground all of the things that are happening under the scenes that are that are trying to make it simple and easy for everyone to do what they're doing without having to think about it I, is, is part of what I end up thinking about with, with this question. Yeah, I love the, um, the CO2 Google. Mm. Yeah. Um, and I think that gets to some of the issues that, that we've been thinking through. Um, but then it, it is this interesting use of the 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 the, <laughs> the interface itself, right, to, to, to make it. And I think this gets to the bizarre discussion of us discussing less when, as Matthew pointed out, part of what you all do is do more as artists, right? <laughs> you know? yes. So it's, it's, it's the logic of more within an economy of less is what we're moving towards, right? Or trying to think through and what that would look like. Um, and how could we make that seductive or interesting? Uh, how could we make it something that is, because you know, with, with, to, give, to, to give it an entirely different and bizarre analogy, 
um, this whole conversation made me think about dieting, right? And so like the, the goal behind dieting is somehow to make less sexy, right? Um, and so in the United States, it's about exercising because you can't possibly consume less, right? This would be a bad thing. So you have to exercise and therefore degrade your body as you're trying to maintain a certain form as you're um, within negotiating these calls both to, to eat more as a sign of love but never gain weight as a sign of love. So, it's, it's, but, the, but I do think that something about this bizarre negotiation of more and less in terms of our bodies and our habits, um, again, to get to the question of the habitual or what would it mean to have the agency? What would it mean to make the, the interior and the exterior do something else? I think it might be really interesting to focus it once more on our bodies. Um, because it just you know one of the most compelling things that have been has been written about global climate change and how to deal with global climate change um, is that move from focusing on the mean. This is Jim Hansen's work, right? So Jim Hansen, NASA climate scientist, for the longest time thought if people only knew, right? If people only knew, they would act differently. And then he's like, no, doesn't make a difference. Um, but what he, he says is, is part of it because, is because a mean is something very different to experience. You don't experience mean temperature, you experience weather. Um, and one side effect of global climate change are weird weather events. So um, events which are three um, standard deviations from the norm have increased. Um, so his argument is, given the increase of these standard deviations, which people experience as deviations, this can be a way, um, global weirding, um, to understand and comprehend and experience what seems inexperienceable, which is climate. Um, so I wonder if there might be, and again, this is a side effect rather than a direct cause or effect. Um, and I wonder if part of the work is thinking through these side effects um, that are viscerally felt or, or engaged with that can get us towards these other issues precisely because they do so obliquely. Yeah, I think one one of the um, the kind of things that leads on from that is the ability of novel kinds of sensing capacities to understand and to to register or make sense of um, things like climate damage. You know, so if if Jim Hansen is saying yes, it's difficult for for humans to to understand a mean and to experience a mean. Um, you know, that's that's because we you know we haven't evolved to do that. But we can we we can work with with things like sensors uh, that detect different kinds of gases and temperatures, uh, the presence of certain kinds of chemical compounds, uh, and so on, and then develop this you know develop systems to um, understand that data and make it sensible, make it tractable. So as again, that's another example of adding uh, rather than adding you know, asking for less, in a sense, and to to expand the domain of the the sensible. Um, through, you know, practice of aesthetic sensing, and you know, I think maybe, maybe that's that's something um, that that has a lot of a lot of possibility. But then the question is, okay, what are the terms by which things are added? What are the things that are made when additions come about? Uh, and there's a very nice uh, part of research in in hacking and and security research. Uh, called Langset, which is language security, and they have a term called uh, weird machines. When when one kind of um, program is attached to another program, that may be just a very simple one, like a website, um, and it's, it's very similar in a way to the work that Ben and Joanna are doing, that, that adds processes to other processes in order to make them function differently. And uh, you know what we one of the things we need to do in some ways is to is to find ways of adding processes to existing systems as they grow and fall apart and collapse that make that make sense of, of, of being alive in different ways, but also make uh, you know ecological conditions just uh, for people and for for animals for the ecology and so on. So this this. The thing that Wendy that Wendy's pointing to, I think, is is really uh, is really important. You know, this this capacity of adding and, and aesthetics of addition that might be at the core of what we're we're looking at. Yeah, it's such a 
we there's our it I love I love Matthew's answer where he didn't answer right away. I mean, it's like it's so hard to do. It's so hard to just say the best thing I can do for this situation, for this problem in the world is to do nothing. And I mean, collectively, we seem to do that all the time as a society, but um, to do nothing about some of the, the world's worst problems. But the individual way to to participate in culture is to, <laughs> to participate in society is to contribute which is almost inevitably like, I have my way, my additional way of doing something. Um, even you know, in, in my own gestures towards erasure, of course, they take a lot of effort to add in order to make the erasure possible. Um, and, and in fact, even slow things down and, and burn more cycles on CPUs. And you know, like there, there's no, it, it's very difficult to escape um, as a, uh, just overall, it's, it's difficult to escape that. Um, okay, well, let me just pause and just see if, if before I would uh, kind of keep going, because we're at about an 8.30. I want to see, Nimrod, are, are there questions coming in from YouTube that we should um, be thinking about? Um, th there are a couple of questions, but maybe also trying to, again, contextualize this question, maybe after that. Uh, you would like to focus on on minus as 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 your kind of suggestion of of removing a lot of the more and a lot of the over I guess over engagement with the platform. Um, so I don't know if you want to talk about that or do you want me to ask the question that's here. Oh, that's that's kind of you. I mean, I'll take I'll take one thing from that, and I'll just it's this is, it's an observation that I I have from watching activity on minus over the last couple of months and. I'm still thinking about it a lot, even what it is, what it, what, what it might turn into, um, which seems to change all the time. But one of the things I most notice as a reaction to the idea of here is a platform upon which you're not asked to focus on accumulation and you're not asked to provide endless participation, but instead it starts with the premise that your opportunities are limited is that so many people, when faced with that, you have 100 posts for life, is at first they say, how could I, that, that's so small, I don't even know what to do with it. And then they say, I'm not really sure what to do with my second post. Like they do number one that complains about the limit. And then they're like, yeah, I'm not sure what to say now. And I think, you know, it's, 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 it's that when they're faced with, the idea that something is limited, all of a sudden they feel um, they feel a weight. They feel like they're supposed to think more deeply about what they do. And then when they're not used to that in the social media space, because that's not how social media is designed. It's designed to animate us into endless production. And so a platform that asks you to limit your production or, or you know, enforces a limit on production um, ends up stopping some people in their tracks. They don't even know what to do with it. Um, of course, I'm always thinking about who said you had to, well, here's one thing that happens, like I've seen this many times, which is people go, okay, well, I think I'm gonna live for another 40 years. And so if I divide 40 years by 100 posts, then that gives me one post every 143 days. So here's number one and I'll see you 143 days. And it, 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 it reveals the way in which the, the the platforms have led us to think that they're they're with us forever, um, that that we'll never escape them, and we we need to um, curate our entire lives with the idea that that they'll be with us. Uh, so one thing I hope that minus does, and I think it does for some people, is it at least forces them to have to think about the difference between a platform that wants infinite. And a platform that wants limit, and and how that gets them to, uh, how that reveals the way we were already thinking about what it means to be on a platform that that has no limits or that we think has no limits. Of course, they all do. But um, yeah, I don't know, Nimrod. Do you want to? Yeah, uh, read a um, question. So there's a question from Robert Good. 
Um, first of all, I loved your exhibition and feel very sympathetic to its perspective. But can you speak about any positives that you might see from the current online environment or do you see it as an entirely problematic? Is it all very bad, basically? It's a classic, where's the optimist? Like, what's the optimistic take kind of? Um, I'm, not, I'm not the optimist in the room generally uh, when it comes to the platforms. <laughs> uh, at the same time, I do think part of what's interesting, I mean, part of what's interesting about them is there is a reason that so many people are there and it's not only monopoly power. Um, there, I mean, I have gained connections with individuals who I wouldn't have otherwise without the platforms. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I think the reason I'm often so pessimistic is because we have privatized what should be fundamental public infrastructure and we've abdicated our responsibility as a society to, um, to take on the development of things that society needs, um, that society can benefit from uh, with computational infrastructure that um, we've left in the hands of a single individual for in the case of Facebook. Um, uh, I don't know, I, I'm, do I see positives? I have trouble. I, I see a lot of negatives. <laughs> Maybe somebody else can help me with the positives. I mean, I'm, I'm never the optimist in the room either when it comes to platforms, but I think that I saw a lot of positives in the past, but I don't see a lot of positives in the future. I don't, I can't see how these platforms can help climate change, for instance, or can help reverse any of the, of the process or dynamics that are basically destroying our planet. Uh, I, I can't see it. I just, I, I can't. I wonder if, you know, with, with nostalgia being involved, whether in 20 years time we'll kind of look back at um, 2005 or six and think, oh, the good old days when Facebook just started or the good old days where MySpace was there. And as the world becomes, I guess, more and more pessimistic, whether this becomes an optimistic point of view then. Um, but I don't know. I don't know how was MySpace when it started because I didn't really use it. I have something good to say. Um, I think that um, this discussion in social media will hopefully get us away from even talking about optimism versus pessimism. Um, because I think that may be part of the problem. And here, I think Lauren Berlant's cruel optimism is just brilliant. Um, and I also think that, that framing things in terms of being optimistic or pessimistic about a platform um, takes us away from some of the fundamental issues around technology, which isn't should we be optimistic or pessimistic about it, right? And optimism. It, it's fundamental to technologies, right? So if you think of how they, literally how these machine learning um, algorithms work, they work through optimization. Um, so I think that the discussions that have emerged from this will hopefully move us away from conversations of optimism versus pessimism because they're so complicated. Um, I also think that, uh, well, we could say what else has been interesting about social media. Um, it's brought out painfully clear some of the problems that we face and by making and framing that people are willing to admit to issues around polarization, racism, discrimination, etc. when it's seen through the rubric of social media or some of these algorithms um, in ways that they haven't or wouldn't face them otherwise, right? So they'll say, oh, this is a discriminatory algorithm or this this is problematic because it does X, Y, and Z, um, but they won't be able, and because it's framed in this way, um, more alliances are being able to be made through people from civil rights and civil liberties um, that might not have been possible otherwise, um, except through this, this perversion, et cetera. 
Um, the other thing I would say that's good about this is that it brings out the ways in which we're fundamentally interconnected. There's one way to view it, which is to say that this, these, these are these companies manipulating us, which is true. Um, but the other way to view it is that they operate by us constantly being in contact with each other and with each other's signals. So it brings out an, a profound understanding of connectivity, or could bring out a profound understanding of connectivity um, that haven't been there before. Um, one could also say that this idea of limitness is interesting in a system that's fundamentally built on um, the idea of limited resources and conflict. So could there be, like ecology, you know, is, is kind of a nasty discipline, right? It's the economics of the, the natural world and it's based on competition and you win when your genes make it to the next generation, whether or not you're miserable. Um, there's a fundamental belief that there are conflict over over everything, like food, etc., um, and that this is 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 a mode of optimization. So, is there a way in which this fake plenitude or imagining of something could be productive in terms of using it to to critique or to think through the limits of of narratives of limits? Um, is it a good way to, for us to conceptualize and understand the ways in which frontier capitalism has operated through a certain notion of limitlessness inscribed on limits? So I think that there, there you know, I, I, I want to go back to the tarot card thing. Like, can we treat this as tarot cards that can actually help us see things and intervene into things and imagine things differently? And that that, that maybe is what's productive about it. So, you know, Fred Jameson famously said, um, he was talking about somebody else saying it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism, but now what we're imagining is the end of the world as the end of capitalism. So I wonder if there is something about ends and imaginings that's productive through this. Yeah, well done. Thank you, Wendy. <laughs> I um, I appreciate that. It's it's uh, it does at least remind me that I I when I try to think about and talk about. I mean, one of the, one of the questions that always comes my way as someone who deals with Facebook as a subject so much is, well, why are you still on Facebook? Or and what about hashtag delete Facebook? And it one of my answers to that is always some version of people want to be in conversation and you know this is a platform where that happens it's a decidedly tremendously problematic one the way it's been erected but um, i guess it also makes me think about the value of strange alternatives or anything that makes these systems feel strange and unnormalizes the ways in which they've uh, led us to to follow the flows that they want most. Um, so uh, th there's my attempt at, at following on some great optimism with a little bit from my side, I guess. Uh, Nimran, do you have a, another one? Yeah, there's another question that might be a bit optimistic, I don't know. Um, from now, Asha, um, if we do make these platforms public, I national nationalizing them, what are the some some of the challenges of implementation? Can we make them nationalized? I guess as well. Well, I think nationalization is not the only option, right? I mean, I think there are, there are mul multiple forms of collectivity that are, that are not just about nations, and you know, nations, you know, are, are, are relatively recent social invention so i think there are there are ways of inventing other other kinds of social form uh that that maybe go beyond the corporation maybe go go beyond the nation uh and that that's what we need to be looking into experimenting with different forms of collectivity different forms of uh communication structures that are, that are not simply uh echoing you know the treaty of westphalia for instance as a as the the basis for human organization Yeah, I, I, I often think about the, 
what I know is that putting this kind of infrastructure in the hands of, of private corporations is absolutely not the answer to any of the problems that we face with them. Um, governments, nations, the, the coming living in the United States have been tremendously problematic in, in the recent past. Um, not to mention beyond that, uh, the, the entire history of the United States is tremendously problematic in the way it operates around the world and the way it operates within its own borders. Um, what's, what's missing is a notion, from my perspective, is a notion of the public. Uh, like it's, it doesn't have to be a nation in control, but it needs to be the public in control. And governments are one way in which we've erected to try to have some broader control over the direction of, of a collective than simply uh, monarchy or, or you know, pick your uh, alternative system. So um, I think this is, you know, part of what I end up thinking about is this moment we're in right now where we, just the last few weeks, think about the last few weeks and, and, and um, Francis Haugen and uh, as, as Joanna mentioned, kind of like the, the failure of Facebook uh, a few weeks ago, it's revealing fragility. And as someone who interacts with uh, tech journalism, uh, tech journalists, uh, as part of my work, watching tech journalists start to speak about uh, and talk about critiques that, that many of us have, are well familiar with over a, a long period of time, I'm starting to hear uh, people speak uh, things that I wouldn't have ever expected them to maybe be talking about in terms of critiques of, of, of some of these technological infrastructures. Um, it does make me wonder uh, too, I mean, this, this may be going off a, a little bit of a veer, but, and, and I'm happy to come back, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking too about kind of what are the, what are the opportunities? I mean, we're, we're at a moment where there's more awareness and visibility on kind of some of the failures of big tech, for example, and, and the ways in which they're operating in the world. Um, where enough people have, have seen some outcome, if it's Brexit in the, in the UK or if it's Trump in the United States, and um, just, just as a couple of examples, but even more recent, you know, with thinking of, of Instagram and toxicity for, for teen girls and, and just the various kind of research findings that have now been leaked out of Facebook that one could have presumed they knew, but now it's, it's on record as they did know. Um, it makes me just, I mean, uh, as a question kind of back to the group, what, what are some opportunities you might see given this landscape to push, push further in, down that road of, of somehow say, arguing for a, a notion of the public in this infrastructure or alternative collective um, accountability structures or auditing, you know, algorithmic auditing or, um, anything along those lines. I'm curious kind of what, what you all see as, as possibility. I, th I mean, I think all of these things are, are certainly possible and, you know, desirable, uh, you know, audit, algorithmic audit is, is a really good uh, set of techniques that people are developing and, you know, have been developing for a long, a long time. Um, I, I think, you know, the question of regulation is interesting but again it's regulation at multiple levels of interface through you know democracy which is an extremely clumsy kind of system and perhaps you know welcomely clumsy in, in some respects but it's you know th there are there are multiple kinds of difficulties with all of these uh with all of these systems as they interact and as they kind of play out various kind of inherited uh fallibilities that um I think it's, it's, it's important not to uh, put too much faith in, in any one of them, but the, just to, to learn more about the, co the complex interplays between them to find out how at a particular moment any, any kind of structure can be tilted uh, in some way to, to produce new effects. But also to think, you know, 
a, a, the level of design what are what are new systems that can be what are new systems that can be built who can be brought in uh, what kind of social agencies what kind of uh, social capacities can be brought in to develop uh, new kinds of new kinds of system or new kinds of thinking that you know go beyond what what we've got at the moment so that 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 wouldn't fall into the register of an optimism versus uh, pessimism thing. It would be a question of like, okay, uh, you know, we live in extremely difficult times. We have to find some some ways of working through them, and the ways that we work through them have cultural, aesthetic, political, uh, and economic consequences. And let's think about them in, in a really rich sense. So I guess my my claim would be let let's develop. Uh, a kind of vocabulary and a, and, a, and a ways of thinking about technology and the wider systems and societies they're embedded in that is rich and supple enough to deal with the, the difficulties of the present and it's the capacity to become adequate to the present that's the real that's the real problem and it's a philosophical one it's a political one and it's an aesthetic as well as technical one so following on uh, what matthew just said um I'm sort of going to present like a practical example of something that can be done. It's not directly, doesn't directly um, identify platforms, but it's a project I'm currently doing uh, here in a major art center in Barcelona. It's called Centro d'Art Santa Monica. So they propose to make a piece. And what I propose to them is that they should work half, they should use half the energy they used to, to use in previous exhibitions. So I cut the energy budget by half. Yeah. And it's super interesting because when I first proposed this to them, they said, okay, we need sensors and things that will regulate energy. And then, you know, like to trigger all these things. They said, no, no, this doesn't have anything to do with technology. It's just to establish a new social contract within the museum. So we need to meet. So we do regular meetings with all them negotiation tables where we negotiate which things we're going to close and which things we're going to open. So the, basically we're, we're all closing the air condition, or lights like the opening day we just shut down the air conditioning it was incredibly hot it was really interesting because it it really visualized all this process and and it's been a really interesting process it's super experimental and this project was um, a reaction to a law that was um, approved in 2017 in the government in Catalonia uh, it's the climate change law which established like a set of measures in order to reduce half percent the CO2 emissions by 2030. They didn't implement anything. They just implemented one tiny thing this day, right? So it, it's a bit like a counter reaction. Um, and finally, like today, somebody from like, a, like an agency of cultural institutions uh, here in Catalonia, they approach, he approached me and they really want to see and see what we are doing right there, right? Because they said that we really lack imagination of how to interact, how to negotiate uh, anything to achieve some sort of more decent, sustainable programs, right? Anyway, I think it's just like something, um, you know, because it's, it is possible, but I think we really lack the imagination to imagine this, <laughs> no, it's, it's even like, anyway, uh, I just, I didn't want to make it about the project, but just to, um, to expose like a practical example of something that could be done, which I think that a lot of other micro things could be done. Uh, and... Yeah, I, one of the things that this gets me thinking about too, you know, the, the problems of regulation, there, there's been a lot of discussion in the last, um, I don't know, a few weeks, I, I feel like I've been seeing it, we're talking about, you know, along these lines of, of algorithmic auditing and, and shouldn't there, what if there was some kind of visibility on the Facebook newsfeed algorithm, for example? And I've seen people I, um, whose, whose work I followed and, and who I've, I've, you know, had affinity with in the past argue that that's just really not possible, that you know, without having all of the data and all the information that it's not really possible to audit or to really understand these algorithms. And I feel like, you know, the, the regulation that we need is, is for some version of enforced transparency that we don't have to know exactly how the Facebook algorithm 
I don't, I don't have to be an expert in the Facebook algorithm. What I need is for the Facebook algorithm to be visible to the world. And then I, I feel fairly certain that someone who gets it will <laughs> at least start to glean some information from it. Um, whereas if we ask governments to somehow determine exactly how a newsfeed algorithm should work or what it should be able to preference and not preference that it's uh, that's something they're not equipped to do. Um, so it's really more, for me, it's more about the potential for, for visibility and, and transparency on, on what the companies have been able so far to rely on, which is proprietary and, and, and private and um, thus trade secret. And so you have no legal avenue to, to investigate. Um, then do you want to, there's another question. So should we go with the last question then? Sure. This one is from Menka um, and they're asking um, what advice if you, if any, do you have for parents thinking about what key messages, practices we want to prioritize sharing with our kids? And I guess if we could maybe try in one sentence, if possible, to answer that. Well, I, I probably can't answer any question in one sentence, but, um, and I don't have children, but uh, one thing I, I do note, note is how many of the people who build Silicon Valley technologies, for example, who do have children, um, don't let their children use the technologies they build. And that, I think that's in a pretty important clue as to how, profoundly, they already understand the effects of, of what they build to be. Um, and so whatever, whatever conversation one might have in that arena, I would suggest it needs to include some discussion of the things I often think about, which is who is this technology for? And, and you know, who does it make most vulnerable uh, you know, who does it make, who is it, who is it do the most for it? Who's it do the least for? Uh, and often the person made most vulnerable by these systems are those who use them and the people who benefit the most from them are those who build them. Yeah, I would also say that there's, there's a lot of good thinking around uh, children and computer use that's been around for, you know, several decades. I mean, I think one of the one of the things we can look at is the work that comes out of uh, constructivist psychology, the people that follow from Vygotsky and, and others uh, that look at how um, the more a child can can learn to develop complex uh, interactions with the, with the materials and to shape the, the scope and range and uh, structure of their interaction with the technology, whether it's you know, mud or code or uh, paint or other kind of environment, whether it's a, a, a city space, uh, the more valuable and rich their interaction can be. And I think that's, that's something that we can, we can look at as a way of, of thinking about it. I, you know, I'm certainly not one of the people who would prohibit children from engaging with, uh, with, with computers, but really to look for those spaces with, with computers that uh, reward kind of rich engagement that is, that is um, articulated on multiple levels. And you can think of kind of the early stages of Minecraft, for instance, as uh, an environment that did that, that would, would be interactive as a game space, that was visual, that was social, uh, but it also allowed you to code, to build spaces, to make Turing complete objects. Uh, and so on. So it was, it was a very, very complex and uh, interesting, but it engage in an environment that would engage you at a number of levels, yet not uh, colonize you with social anxieties, which I think a lot of social media does. So it's something that gives you expressive capacity and expands your, your world, 
to use a kind of corny phrase, but that doesn't then recode your nervous system into something dependent upon its services. I have no children. This is the best thing I've done for global climate change. <laughs> Matthew, on the other hand. Um, Joanna, did you have any thoughts? Yeah, because I do have children. Eh? I have one, one, that's it, to stay here <laughs> for the sake of uh, climate. No, I really agree with Matthew. I don't think I, I can add anything uh, further on. There is um, several uh, sort of alternative uh, video games that they are much more about exploration. There is a wonderful um, Canadian um, studio that uh, does uh, amazing stuff. Uh, I can't remember the name. So bad with names. Um, uh, end of Tales? Tales of, I don't know. Anyway, I can put it in the chat if I remember. Uh, which is wonderful. There is also this Brazilian, Italian, Brazilian um, a studio called Mall Industry that they do a lot of uh, incredible games. Also, they're also quite critic. Um, so I think there is a lot of very good materials out there. And it just uh, exactly what Matthew um, just said, right? Something that doesn't just uh, colonize you with anxiety and uh, and with modes uh, or more role models that they're not yours and, and you don't identify with and, and they generate a lot of anxiety because you don't fulfill this, right? Which I think it's very, very easy to fall in in this area. So yeah, I mean, they're not mainstream, but there is a lot of materials out there. Yeah, I, I'm thinking a little bit further too, you know, from my perspective, the one of the things that led me to play with and have so much fun with computers when I first started doing that was the ability to manipulate an experiment. And the, you know, Silicon Valley is all about producing interfaces, systems, platforms that are about consumption and prescribed interaction. And even if you're gonna be on a social media platform, which I think you know, has potential problems in terms of the things Matthew was talking about, there's still a, there is opportunity to, to look at what that platform wants from, from you and to then use that as a place from which to work against or to, to, to experiment, um, to not just take these systems the way they are, but to, to play in them, um, to experiment. Um, and they don't really want that. They want you to do something that is predictable. Uh, so maybe the, the one sentence would be, be unpredictable. Great. There's a few other comments on the chat, but I wonder if we should wrap it up with this um, um, be unpredictable. And also together with this, the idea of, of less and imagination, um, less, not less imagination, less and imagination um, as, as kind of points, takeaways from this. Um, just want to say again that on Saturday, there's Ben will be in the gallery giving a talk and a tour about the exhibition. It will be the last day. Uh, and that talk is going to be on our YouTube and on Albert on the screen next couple of days. Um, yeah. Anything else? I just want to thank everyone for taking the time to have a conversation. I really appreciate it. I'm getting to hear your all's thoughts and, and just to uh, think for a little bit with you all. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining. I wish we could have done this like in London. <laughs> no, it could have been very fun. Next time. Yeah, now some dinner, some beers. <laughs> Great. Cool, right. thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.